Come on in, everyone. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right, and I can hear you too, so that works. Awesome. I hate it when that audio crap goes out. Anybody have any questions while we're waiting for everybody else to come in? So uh, your class actually does have their final, your final on Monday. Uh, so you are uh, required to take it that day. You can take it as early uh, as 4.45, about an hour beforehand, because you're allowed two hours and 15 minutes uh, to take it. We always have a one hour and 15 minute class, so you can start it up to an hour early if you can fit that in your schedule. And that'll allow you the whole hour, two hours and 15 minutes. Or you can start it on time, but no later than on time. And that'll give you till basically an hour later than we normally get out, which is seven. So we'll get out at eight. Uh, but if you start late, you, you could very well cut yourself short of time. So uh, the, the exam will just stop when you, whether you're ready or not. So make sure you do it at that time. If you have some conflict today, tomorrow is the last time if you can let me know of that. I can set up a testing in a testing center. I can uh, uh, so, uh, create a whole different test and let you take that on uh, a different day if you can't make it Monday. But the main thing is you got to let me know. As uh, far as I know, I've taken care of everyone because I've only had two people request things. One person had to do it the day after and another person had to do it at the testing center because their uh, computer doesn't work very well with uh, respondents. I did open up the midterm for respondents. Hopefully you all saw that email. I opened up the midterm respondents uh, practice quiz just so you can uh, try respondents again. There might be an update to respondents that you need to download. Uh, and you should probably do that immediately just to make sure everything's working. I would not wait till last minute as I tried to warn you in the email. If uh, if the day of the exam comes along and you, your computer all of a sudden won't work, I, that could be reason for me to give you a zero on your final, which means you'd have to either come back after the break, take it over again, or you just get an F for the course or something like that. And I don't want that, neither do you. Uh, and no, we will not have class. Uh, basically that exam and you're studying for it, is more than enough to account for the hours of uh, that last week. Uh, plus I'm giving off extra tutorial sessions. Remember all this week, the labs for 241, you're welcome to attend any of them. I gave you the invitations last, uh, last week. So you can attend any of those for question and answer sessions. You're not required to attend your lab unless you have someone else other than me for lab, but you're not allowed to, uh, required to attend uh, your lab if, if you're my student. But you can, and it's uh, open question and answer session. You guys drive it, though. I'm not lecturing. It's just you come with questions. And when no one has any more questions, we'll probably call it a day. Anything else? So our, so our last scheduled lecture is this Wednesday, the 8th, and then our final is next Monday, and that's it. Yep. Yep. And we'll finish okay. most of 43, uh, 44 today. Uh, we'll, and actually, we'll go beyond what's talked about 44. So we'll finish it up. It's pretty straightforward to problems you're going to uh, encounter. And I've decided on, in this class in 241, I'm not doing 243 uh, and 44 on the final exam, but I am doing them in this last test. Anything else? So on my lab and mastering, the only one that we need to do for extra credit is the chapter 44, right? Because you made that uh you made that a uh, requirement right since we yeah that it. one should be a requirement uh yeah i'm probably gonna stick to that decision but yeah i would do 44 just to and it's pretty easy stuff it's you know a little, using a little bit of relativity so that'll help you get prepared for the final anyways uh but it's also uh you know doing distance equals velocity times time to figure out how long it takes to get somewhere in outer space, you know, for instance, the, the time unit of a, a light year is a unit of distance, but it's found by taking the velocity of light and multiplying it by time. So I don't know why I said time unit first, but anyways, so it's a lot of little stuff like that, not very difficult things, scale factors and stuff, Hubble's equation. Anything else? 
All right, so I thought I'd start off with uh, this chapter is called Astrophysics and Cosmology. And astrophysics is the application of physics to astronomy. And cosmology <sighs> is somewhat like that. And in that sense, cosmology is a subset of astrophysics. But cosmology is uh, on a scale so large that galaxies are considered point particles. So you can imagine when you study cosmology, our Milky Way galaxy, which is literally 100,000 light years across or in diameter roughly, you can imagine that as being a point particle to a cosmologist. Then the cosmologists try to study, well, how do those point particle galaxies come together to form groups and then to form uh, groups with groups to make clusters and to make super clusters. You can form clusters with clusters and you get all sorts of structure in the universe where you'll see long apparent walls of galaxies like galaxies in two dimensions all over really pretty closely packed all in one either flat or sometimes round area and then you'll see something right next to it like a void which is like you see no apparent galaxies in there whatsoever and it's huge these are the biggest things in, in the universe in general is these walls and voids and sometimes you'll see little uh tendrils uh, looks like uh, almost like the tentacles of, a, of an octopus, but even thinner. And they're just long strings of galaxies all uh, sort of connected in a, in a fairly thin line compared to the size of the, the length of the line. That's cosmology. I haven't yawned all day. I don't know why I am now. But anyways, so that's cosmology. And we're going to start off teaching you a little bit about astronomy and, and let you understand uh, how much we did know, even from the ancient Greeks. So uh, not only that, I, I don't want to short sell the Egyptians because basically the, the big cultures, the first of the cultures that, that weren't hunters and gatherers were Egypt and then Greece and then Rome. And then, of course, it went through various groups, uh, including uh I can't remember the name of it, but basically Persia. And then it included Europe, uh, which was basically, uh, well, the Turks. And then, of course, you had ultimately Great Britain and France and Spain taking turns and the United States and all this good stuff. So all these different cultures. And really what makes, makes cultures like that important is uh, basically they got things honed down and understood well enough that they could do science, that they could do math, that they could do art and poetry and literature and stuff like that. And the only reason why they could is they were no longer hunters and gatherers. And in fact, they learned a bartering system where they could trade and exchange goods. So if you happen to be a hunter, then you could sell your, you know, sell what you, what you managed to capture or kill uh, and people could, use their art, for instance, to sell, and they could get money to trade to you to get uh, food and stuff like that. And when you are having that no longer dire need to feed your family or yourself immediately every day by some extreme course of changing where you're at and, and hunting down stuff, then you can uh, actually use agriculture. And then, of course, from science, you can get agriculture. And from science, astrology, uh, astronomy initially, which initially started off as astrology, which is a pseudoscience. But that astrology slash astronomy is understanding the universe, which ultimately became science. And that's what allowed us to, you know, become farmers. And then you could get, you know, uh, whole many, many, many thousands of people fed from single fields and stuff of that sort. So that's why it's sort of important to us. But I want you to understand that Egypt, yeah, as far as we know, is, is the first one. And they actually did quite a bit of astronomy as well, even though I'm sort of starting off talking about the Greeks. So the, part of the reason the Greeks were so good is they had a lot of data from the Egyptians and also uh, during, during this time period when the ancient Greeks were doing this stuff, then later when the Romans were doing the stuff, uh, once the Romans take over, you've got that area called the Levant, which is sort of the eastern end of the Mediterranean, uh, and this is around the time that Jesus would have walked the earth, uh, and in, in that time period, you had a real... Uh, crazy divergence of people you, you had people interacting with uh people that actually believed in the gods of egypt you had people that believed in the uh, greek gods you had uh, other pagans as well uh you had people that believed in the roman gods which of course the roman empire was just a empire that absorbed the 
uh, Greek empire and therefore took their same gods and, you know, changed Aphrodite to Venus and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then, of course, you also had regions coming in from the from the European area, the Gauls and stuff like that later on. But uh, all those different groups coming together, the Persians. And during what we like to call the medieval times, I generally call them the Dark Ages, because if you look at a, a plot of discovery of science over time, you'll see these huge you know, waves of all this information and all these discoveries being made. And then there's this black spot on the graph. And that time is the Dark Ages, which, again, my, my good friend who's a medievalist would, would really, you know, get angry with me using the phrase uh, Dark Ages. But that's basically why I use that phrase is from a science standpoint, it went dark. And in some sense, it really did. But here's the weird thing. And it's not, you know, post 9-11 uh, political correctness. So I've heard people on the radio argue that and that's not the case at all but in fact uh uh what we would modern day what would be modern day arabs and muslims or what thomas jefferson would have called Mohammedans, uh those groups took this the knowledge that the ancient greeks and the romans had actually created and built on it while we were having our quote-unquote dark ages so that's why we've got words like algorithm and algebra and sine and cosine they come from uh, a language more like Persian and stuff of that sort. So all that was going on. Now, it's a common misconception uh, that a lot of people have that uh, at the time Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, that the earth was not known to be round. And that's that's completely wrong. OK, uh, he knew it. He knew the earth was a sphere. He was using Aristotle's data. Uh, but in fact, the ancient Greeks knew that as well. A guy by the name of er Eratosthenes was uh, the librarian at the Library of Alexandria, and he had read of a well in Syene, and in that well on a certain day at noon, sun, the sunlight would shine all the way down to the bottom of the well. So this is like one of those Bugs Bunny, Elmer Fudd, Donald Duck type uh, wells that you see, or Daffy Duck type wells, not the Donald Duck, uh, Daffy Duck type wells that you see where they have a little rock wall around it, and then they have like a, some wood, uh, uh, pilings that go up and there's a little roof and they got a little axle and you spin the axle and that cranks a rope up and there's a bucket on it or you could drop the bucket down let it fall in the water and then crank it up that's the kind of well they had but it was you know obviously without the cool roof on top because on a certain day at a certain time of the year at a certain time of that day uh the sunlight shines straight down that uh well well eratosthenes realized oh that's the time when this rays of sunlight are running exactly radially to the earth. In other words, they're pointing right to the center of the earth. And from that, he said, well, if I can measure what kind of shadow a vertical pole casts uh, at my location at the same time that it, uh, of course, shines all the way down to the bottom of that well, then I can use that in basic geometry to figure out the radius of the earth. And they had already figured out that the earth was in fact a, a sphere. And you can see that from an eclipse. All you had to do was take an artist and have them draw a lunar eclipse uh, like every five, 10 minutes during the lunar eclipse. And when you do that, you'll see there's a shadow going over the moon. That shadow is a shadow of the earth. Uh, and they understood that as well. And that shadow of the earth is exactly the shape that you'd expect for a circular or spherical planet blocking light from a circular slash spherical moon. Uh, so they were able to tell already that the Earth was a sphere based on that. They also knew stuff like when uh, sailors went out to sea, the last thing that would disappear would be the top of their mast, as if the Earth was curving downwards and other stuff like that. So they had a, a lot of knowledge uh, already that told them that the Earth was round. And then, of course, the uh, you know nail in the coffin would definitely be the, the shape of the shadows. So in doing that, they said, well, we know it's a sphere. Let's figure out what its radius is. And Eratosthenes did it. And in fact, Eratosthenes did it and got a much better, much more accurate value than did Aristotle, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years later. So it's pretty impressive what Eratosthenes did. And sadly, if uh, Christopher Columbus would have known Eratosthenes figure as opposed to Aristotle's figure, he might not have even planned his trip around the world to circumnavigate the globe, because technologically speaking, they were a little bit at a loss to actually make such a long journey without a ginormous continent between here and there, because he was thinking the Earth was about 40% its size, and instead it was, like I said, about 40% uh, larger than he thought it was, and there was another chunk of land back there they didn't know of. And of course, we all know the Vikings had been here before, but still, uh, the, the main point is Christopher Columbus 
sort of got lucky because they might have all started death basically if the, if the uh north american south america and the caribbean islands and stuff like that wasn't there they might not have been able to survive the trek all the way around the globe through nothing but water uh, without uh you know more food sources not bigger ships and stuff like that so that's kind of neat so what did eratosthenes do well let me draw it on a piece of paper so eratosthenes learned that in Syene, uh on the summer solstice there was a a uh, particular spot on earth where the sunlight shined down to the bottom of a well. Let's imagine this is the earth. And let's imagine this is a well at Syene, like this, going straight radially. So it's, if you follow this straight back, you get to the center of the earth. And then he was over here. Let's say he's on the equator, just for argument's sake. Uh, what we know is the rays of sunlight are all parallel so they'll come in at this angle and this angle and this angle so if we can figure the angle of that ray causing that uh causing that shadow right there we can figure out the angular difference between this spot on earth and this spot on earth back to the equal uh, back to the center of the earth that's really like a latitude angle so this one casts no shadow. And this one was on the order of uh, seven degree shadow. So basically what he did was say seven degrees is to this distance D as 360 degrees is to the circumference of the earth. So it's sort of like, yeah, if you divide this angle by this length, that should be the same thing as the angle if it was twice as wide, that angle divided by twice the length. And therefore, you keep going up till you get to uh, 360 degrees and you get that. Well, from that, he was able to determine uh, the he was able to determine the circumference, the radius and the diameter of the Earth because they're all given by C equals 2 pi R, R equals pi D. So from that, he was able to get it. And like I said, he got it within depending on how you define one of the stadia, the measurements that he was using, uh, he was either within 7% or within uh, 14%, I think is the difference. But there was two existing uh, measurements for stadia. Uh, and uh, if he was referring to one, he was quite a bit, he was off by about 14%. But if, if he was referring to the other, then he was on the money, like with less than 7% uh, off. So that's pretty amazing, but he had that. Now, the other thing uh, that the ancient Egyptians knew was, for instance, they did that experiment or they did that thought experiment I told you about earlier about how uh, if you imagine taking a piece of metal, cut it in half and then take half of it and cut that in half, take half of that, cut that in half and keep on doing it. They knew there would be two possible scenarios. One was that you could split it uh, infinitely and they just said that was absurd. There's no way they can do that. So they came up with the other one, which was there is some smallest piece where you couldn't cut it anymore and uh, it was no longer divisible and the word in greek for divisible was tom t-o-m and the prefix that you would put on it to make it indivisible would be ah so atom and we got the name of the atom of course we've since seen from elementary particles that the only things we can't split apart now are the leptons the gauge bosons and of course the quarks so those are the the modern day equivalent of whatever the atom was uh, but we still have other things like the atoms, the smallest part you can have of an element, the molecules, the smallest part you can have of a compound, and so on and so forth. So they had that knowledge. They had a lot of knowledge. And in fact, they even imagined a scenario in which the Earth was not the center of the universe. And for them, of course, the universe was just uh, the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, the moon, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and then the stars you see in the night sky, which are not very far away. And in fact, it's true that the, the stars you see in the night sky with the unaided eye are all just in a little sphere centered on us well within our Milky Way galaxy. We're not seeing any stars with the naked eye uh, that are outside of our galaxy. We're only seeing uh, the stars, in fact, very close to us on the order of, say, a couple thousand light years. So it's a very small chunk of the, of the universe that we even see with our naked eye. But they thought that was the entirety of the universe. 
But again, they had considered, wait, maybe we weren't the center. Maybe we might even be orbiting the sun. In fact, one person whose name uh, escaped me, escapes me, but I think it's Aristarchus, not to be confused with Eratosthenes, Aristarchus. Uh, I think he's the one that, that suggested the sun might actually, or the earth might actually orbit the sun. Uh, but during those dark ages, a lot of uh, documents were destroyed because they were written in crazy language and stuff like that. So they just destroyed them. Uh, and hence, we only know a very few things that Aristarchus said, but one of the things he said was that uh, the Earth might be orbiting the sun. So that's kind of crazy. But what they did was they decided that if, in fact, the Earth was moving, then you should be able to see stars that are close to us move relative to the stars that are, are far away from us as we move. And in fact, you can think of it this way. Uh, this is related, for instance, to parallax, but you can imagine if I'm looking over here at this lantern on my bookshelf, uh, if I look through it, uh, uh, to it through this eye right here, then I see it's that lantern is sitting right there. But now if I close that eye and, and uh, look th through this one, now I see it sitting there. So I've actually seen the lantern move like this, just from going from this eye to this eye, it goes from here to here. And then going back, it goes from there to there and back and forth. So if we were actually orbiting something, we'd expect to see a star that's closer to us go wiggle back and forth like this. They couldn't detect that. They couldn't detect that parallax. They couldn't detect that uh, motion of a distant star compared to a more distant star at all. So they knew there was two scenarios. Either the universe was way bigger than they could measure it like that. Or two, they were in fact the center and they just could not imagine the universe being that big. So they threw away that hypothesis, which turned out to be the right one. So they stuck us at the center, okay? And the first models were made by uh, some of the people in the schools of the Pythagoras, uh, Ptolemy, not, now there's several Ptolemy in history, so be careful with that. There's several Ptolemies that became like a title as well. So in ancient Egypt, uh, you could become a Ptolemy even though your name wasn't Ptolemy. Uh, just like you could become in Rome uh, a Caesar, even though your name wasn't Julius Caesar. So uh, that's what happened. So you got to make sure you're looking at the right Ptolemy. Uh, that created ultimately the Ptolemaic model of the solar system of our universe. And let me give you a little rundown of what that was. So I've already explained to you why they concluded that we weren't moving. Uh, and then how did they actually make sense of the world around them? Well, one of the things they noticed was that, in fact, there were certain stars that always look the same. Like if you come out, you know, uh, one night and you see a star system and maybe you see some stars that look like this. Anybody recognize that star pattern? That's actually somewhat Gemini. This angle is a little, it should be more like that instead of that, but that's essentially Gemini. This looks like a mirror reflection of that. And this one's foot turns to a 90 degree, whereas this one turns to a obtuse angle. Like I said, not as straight as it was, it should really be more like this or something. But anyways, if you came back the next night, it would look the same way. Those stars are not moving with respect to each other. And in fact, if you came back in the same month the following year, they still look the same way. And the same month, 10 years later, they still look the same way. It takes, in fact, uh, thousands of years for you to see that they're actually moving. And luckily, because we have data from ancient Egypt from even 25 and 3,000 years ago, we have enough data to actually see how those stars have moved over time. And we can tell exactly how the stars are moving in space. Now, these were the stars. This is the way they looked. And in fact, this particular constellation was a uh, part of the constellation or groups of stars known as the Zodiac. And they are the, the zodiacal constellations. And they basically were the constellations that the sun could be found in in different times of the year. So they were smart enough, for instance, to realize, hey, if it's midnight and this constellation is due south of us, then I know since it's midnight, the sun is directly below our feet. So it's in the constellation that's actually opposite of Gemini. And they had that picture in their mind or what those uh, 12 or 13 constellations were. So they knew exactly what constellation uh, it would be in. And of course, this is, uh, this is a constellation of Gemini. So if you go six months earlier, 
uh, you would look probably in uh, the month of January, roughly. And I, th I want to say that's maybe Virgo or something like that. So they would say uh, the sun's in Virgo or something, right? Well, that's what they saw. And in fact, they pictured it as if there was this giant crystalline sphere around our universe. And outside of that crystalline sphere was a, was a, a huge fire. And the crystalline sphere had little holes in it. And those little holes were what the stars were. That was, and they, that was them blinking because the, the flames were fluttering and stuff like that. So it was a kind of neat idea. But then if you paid attention long enough, as the ancient Egyptians did, as the ancient Greeks did, and as the ancient Romans did, you might one day wake up and find a star here that wasn't there before. And then a couple of weeks later, you might find it's here. A couple of weeks later, you might find it's here. A couple of weeks later, you might find it's here. A couple of weeks later, you find it getting bigger and brighter. And then you find it going off like this. So what happened is it looked as if this particular object wandered through our constellation, making a loop-de-loop, -loop, okay? And of course, the Greek word for wanderer is planetos. So there were stars and then there were planetos and the planetos were the wanderers because they wandered through the stars, whereas the stars looked like they were holes in a giant crystalline sphere. And in fact, it was also noticed that the stars got brighter along this. So in order to account for all that stuff, they made a uh, geocentric model of the universe like this. So here's the earth. And something they noticed, for instance, was Mercury and Venus never got very far away from the sun. And in fact, Mercury stayed really close to the sun. So what they do is they first take uh, and put an orbit out here. Let's go ahead and do this. I'll say this is the orbit of the moon. So I'll just put a big M on it. Now you come out here and there is an orbit for Mercury. But in order to make sense of it, they had to imagine an imaginary line going out to the center of the sun. And then that line had on it the center of another circle that was called an epicycle. And in fact, Mercury was on that. So they had a deferent and then they had an epicycle. And uh, the center of the epicycle had to be along the line connecting the center of the Earth and the center of the sun at all times. That's the way they kept the uh, Mercury always being close to the sun. And that also explained the loop de loo because this got brighter specifically because that was the time when Mercury was closest to the Earth. And they did the same thing with Venus, only Venus got further away. So they had to make a bigger uh, epicycle. So this is Venus. But it also was tied on that line for no, you know, no good reason, really. And then outside of that, of course, uh, was Mars. So Mars would actually orbit out here. This was the sun, as I said. Uh, Mars would or orbit out here. And, and they all eventually got epicycles and deference and some other points, too. And then there was Jupiter. And then there was Saturn. And then outside of that was the giant crystalline sphere. And fire, okay? So that was the uh, pre-Copernican Ptolemaic model, but was also sanctioned by Aristotle later because basically these astrologers who were the, the people that could compute these things, uh, they would get together every, you know, or get the data together every five to 10 years and make a new uh, almanac, if you will, of the positions of the planets over the last years. And they would tweak the rate at which this Mercury uh, orbits around the center and the rate at which uh, the Venus rotates around that center and the rate at which the sun goes around uh, the Earth. 
and the rate at which the moon goes around the earth and these epicycles and deference and eventually they even had to put some different points in here uh called equip points and it was just a, it was a mess and it was hard to calculate uh but all of it was because of aristotle who had said basically hey there's four elements earth wind fire and water i'll get rid of this now uh water and of course there was also the quintessence which of course is milo jovovich okay and if you're one of the eight people that saw that movie, congratulations, you get that joke. But anyways, the quintessence was supposed to be heavens. Uh, and that was the fifth element. The first four were earth, wind, fire, and water. And basically what was going on is Aristotle understood motion as two types. There was natural motion, which is these elements trying to get to their natural place. So anything made of earth, which would be rocks and wood and stuff like that, uh, they would be trying to reach the center of the earth. Wind, which was like our atmosphere, that was above the earth. So it would try to lift up. Uh, fire was like our sun that was above the air and water was like uh, able to dig deep below the surface of the earth. So when they were doing that stuff, that was natural motion. And if they were uh, doing anything else, they had to be forced and the force had to be maintained. So uh, that was how nature was explained in terms of moving. And of course, by the time you go through Aristotle getting all this, uh, we have developed a, a new major religion. We're talking about uh, Europe and Catholic Church and uh, basically the entire biblical scripture that had been approved at the Council of Nicaea had now been interpreted in, term of, in terms of Aristotle's teachings. So all this stuff was tied together and was very, very complicated and would sort of unravel a lot of stuff if you changed all this. That's why there was so much reluctance to switch from a geocentric universe. Okay, so that was the Ptolemaic model. Now along comes a guy by the name of Copernicus And Copernicus, for all the wrong reasons, says we're wrong, okay? He basically says, hey, we've gotten too far from Aristotle. We've got circles and circles, which is what they were referencing in A Bug's Life. If you remember, they were getting on uh, the smart bug in A Bug's Life for his tunnel in the inside of a tunnel. That's what they're referencing here. So uh, he said, we have epicycles on deference. We have equant points and we just have all this mess. And in, at the end of the day, we've got nothing that looks like the perfect sphere because one of the other things that uh, Aristotle taught was for starters, you had these uh, very distinct fundamental principles that was obvious and hence need no proof. And they were stuff like the quintessence, the heavens are perfect. The perfect shape is the sphere. Ergo, everything in the heavens must be the sphere or maybe a circle because it's the two-dimensional version of a sphere. So, you know, those, those rules seem really goofy to us, but they seem perfectly solid to them. So when Aristotle went along with this model and, and of course approved it, his idea was everything in the heavens had to be perfect. They couldn't be, un, they couldn't be changing. Uh, they were literally unchanging because if they changed, they obviously changed from imperfect to perfect, which meant the heavens were imperfect for some time, or they changed from perfect to imperfect, which meant the heavens were now imperfect, neither of which was acceptable. So it's, it's sort of some iffy logic <laughs> right but that was how all their ideas were made up and these were all done to try to keep from alienating those principles copernicus says well we tried to keep from alienating those principles but we've actually gotten rid of all of them because we got you know equal points from which the center of this episode uh, from the center of which is uh deferent looks like it's going at a constant rate and all this weird stuff uh, i think i can do better and in fact all he does is he takes the sun and puts it at the center. And then he says, Mercury is orbiting it in a perfect circle. 
and then Venus is orbiting it in a perfect circle, and then Earth with the moon orbiting it is orbiting in a perfect circle, and then Mars, and then Jupiter, and then Saturn. And everything was perfect. Everything was perfectly circular. Everything was going at a constant speed. All of that was completely consistent with Aristotle. The only difference was we had replaced the sun uh, or replaced the earth with the sun. And uh, this is what I call the Copernican revolution where we became not the center of the universe. So that's kind of important, but it's also where he did it for all the wrong reasons. He was appealing to authority, not because the data showed him anything better. That being said, these results turned out to be just as good as those results at that time period. So, uh, but it was more natural. You didn't have to have that special line and the special circle on a circle and all that good stuff. And it came up naturally that, that Mercury had a shorter period than Venus and that Venus had a shorter period than Earth and Earth than Mars and then Mars than Jupiter and then Jupiter than Saturn. So all of that was naturally falling out of it. So that was good, but the data was just as good. So the predictions, uh, the data slash predictions were exactly as good, exactly as good as Ptolemy, Ptolemy slash Aristotle. So we really had no reason to change. Everybody was happy. Uh, in fact, the, the church didn't get upset. Copernicus was one of their guys. So they weren't upset because, you know, it's just a new way of thinking about the universe. And they didn't really too worry too much about the sun being the center. And, you know, it could save them money in terms of how long the calculations took for Copernicus to predict where the planets would be. Because you got to remember, all of this stuff is in the time where astrology was thought to be a science. And, for instance, what constellation your, uh, your king's sun is in, in other words, what are, I should say, what planet our star is in the constellation that belongs to your to your king that can make all the difference in the world like if you find mars the god of war is in the constellation of gemini and your king's uh, gemini then uh that might not be a good time to uh i don't know marry someone right so they had to have these predictions like even we have to this day for instance the way easter works is easter is supposed to be uh, after the first uh, autumnal, e after the autumnal equinox, you find the first full moon, and then the first Friday thereafter is is Good Friday, and then Sunday is uh, Easter. So you even need it to this day to predict dates of things, and that's what they needed it for, and for the astrologers to tell them when it was precipitous to make uh, decisions and to changes, uh, make changes and stuff like that. So this was pretty good, but it was, wasn't, like I said, a, a big data set easier, but it was a lot easier for them to calculate. Well, along comes Kepler and a guy by the name of Tycho Brahe. And I think that's pronounced Tigo. He, he's a Dane. He's from Denmark. And Brahe's his name. And he's kind of a, a cool character. He's, he's sort of the Russell Brand. of this era. So, you know, Russell Brand wrote his autobiography, he called his Bookie Wookie, where he admitted to being a uh, sex addict and, and a crazy person. He does drugs, lots of drugs, is in the rock and roll, all that crazy stuff. He used to be mar married to Katy Perry. Uh, so that was Russell Brand. And Russell Brand was actually really brilliant. And, I, and to be honest with you, I think Russell Brand's way smarter than a lot of people know anyways. But this Russell Brand character, live to party. So Tycho Bray, he would basically get up one, two, three o'clock in the afternoon, and then he'd just begin to party. And he would party all day with all his friends. He had a pet human that we would call, say, a little person or a person whose growth was stunted. That was his pet human. He had a pet monkey. He sadly one day got a deer so drunk that the deer fell down the steps and broke its neck and died. Uh, in many ways, he was an awful product of his time. And he also was super noble. So uh, nobility, of course, they don't poop or pee. We all know that they, they're special higher beings. So he actually spent his whole day sometimes not using the restroom at all. 
And sometime after Kepler came and worked with him, he sat all day partying and would not relieve himself lest someone figure out that he went to relieve himself and his bladder exploded and he died of sepsis in a very painful death. Uh, not unlike the death that George Washington felt, except George Washington was doing something cool and classy. So that sort of Tycho Brahe, uh, he also got in a, a sword fight when he was in college over who was the better mathematician, and he had his nose cut off with a sword, and he wore a silver and gold prosthetic on it with wax. Uh, so he's kind of a, a interesting, strange character like that. But here's what happened. He had a model that was sort of like the, the bastardization of the two. OK, basically, you take all of this, all this crap going on right here and you just leave the sun out. And then you put the sun over here and say all that crap's orbiting the sun. <laughs> and that was Brady's model, which is really problematic when it comes to Galileo uh, and his observations of Venus and stuff like that. Uh, so anyways, it's kind of neat that uh, Copernicus knew or Galileo knew that and chose not to tell it. But anyways, uh, he had that idea and he just couldn't work out the mathematics. Meanwhile, Kepler, who is a sad story, he's short sighted. He's got piles. He's got rickets. Uh, he frequently has to go back to his hometown to get his mother out of jail uh, because sadly at that era when a woman uh, was widowed uh, and lost her teeth, which was very common in the time. I mean, uh, European areas don't have that great of dental care already still, so we're always having issues, but anyways, they lose their teeth, and that just creeped out men, so they would just say she was a witch, and he had to come back and defend her in trial literally like three or four times, uh, but he was, he was the, uh, he was the Mike Pence of that era, so, you know, Mike Pence, super conservative ultimate you know nice guy you know wants to pray all the time doesn't want to be left in a room with a with a woman uh that's not his wife alone any, any stuff like that so imagine these two guys russell brand and mike pence hanging out this is going to be exciting right so kepler has his own ideas for a model he believes in the copernican system where their son is at the center but he doesn't think it's a coincidence that the number of planets is just the right number to be separated by the number of perfect solids that we know of. So he's trying to build this model like this, only the planets are separated by the perfect solids. And he writes his description up uh, and sends it to all his friends, one of which is Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe says like, wow, this dude's a really good mathematician. Hey, I bet you could help me. So he hires Johannes Kepler. Now, Johannes Kepler comes there and sees this, uh, sort of he complains about him being a, a brash, slob uh he parties all day and and also he's he's a little apprehensive to give his data to johannes kepler because he realized kepler is really really smart and uh he could actually show him up and so he's a little bit worried about that as best we can tell but again he parties all day and all night until that one day he dies and then uh kepler asks the court to complete his work and the court chooses uh to let him over the wishes of the family specifically the family saw the same thing that bray he saw and he gets the data and he worked out the Ptolemaic model and that was way the crap off. He worked out the Copernican model and that was way the crap off. Uh, he worked out Brahe's model, that was way the crap off. He even worked out his own model of the uh, perfect solid separating the planets and the sun. Uh, and that was crap too. In the end, he had to come up with his three laws of planetary motion, which we talked about in uh, the gravity chapter. And it was that that he got right. And in fact, it was everything that would have made Copernicus roll over in his grave, the uh, shapes of the orbits were not circles. They were bastardized versions of circles called ellipses, but they were exactly ellipses, not ovals, something that's ill-defined. We're talking the actual mathematical structure that is an ellipse. Uh, so he had elliptical orbits with the sun at one focal point. They swept out equal areas in equal times. That meant the heavens were changing because the planets would speed up and slow down. And the square of the period was proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. And that was uh, the, the big laws that made all of the figuring of the, of the uh, annals easy. So you could take, uh, for instance, an almanac and write it up in maybe a third of the time as you used to have to, even with Copernicus's model, and it fit the data. And in fact, it was right. The only thing that's different about it is we know now know that the precession of the perihelion of Mercury 
uh, is a problem that we can understand with uh, with Newton's gravity, but it's off. Like Newton's gravity predicts the precession of the perihelion to be a different rate than it was in general relativity gives the right rate. Uh, so it's not that different, but Johannes Kepler came up with all that. That was really brilliant. Uh, we had already, of course, measurements of the size of the Earth, the distance to the Earth, the distance, or excuse me, to the Sun, the distance to the Moon from the Sun, I mean, from the Earth, and the distance uh, from the Earth to the Sun. I'd already mentioned that. We even knew how big this, the uh, Moon was, and we knew that from the ancient Greeks just from being able to look at that that model that I told you about, if you had an artist draw the various stages of a lunar eclipse, you'd see that basically there's a shadow and it's a circular shadow and it's wiping over the face of the moon. You can figure out the size of that circle and you see that that circle is about uh, three times bigger than the moon. Well, the ancient Greeks said, oh, well, if only we knew how much that, that uh, shadow tapers in going from the earth to the moon and causing the eclipse. Well, they did. They remembered that during a solar eclipse, the shadow of the uh, actual moon lands on the Earth and it shrinks from the size of the moon, which is how big the blocker is, to essentially zero size at the surface of the Earth. So it's clear that the sh shadow actually truncates by one moon diameter. And therefore, uh, we know that the moon is one fourth the size of the sun. So they knew all this cool stuff. They used that to work out all these distances. And then these guys come along and start to sort everything out. And they've got this, you know, comprehensive model of the universe. In comes Galileo. Again, people are just sort of going with the flow. Everything's fine. Uh, these are just new models uh, that allow you to work out your calendars better. Galileo comes up and, and just not okay with that. You know, he's got to make a big fuss and he's very arrogant and he's uh, uh, brilliant, which in some sense is right for you to understand that you're you're really brilliant, just like, you know, uh, a modern day model might think she's beautiful and she'd be right. And it's, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. Well, the same thing with Galileo here, but he gets into a little bit of trouble because he's forcing it in too harsh a way. He goes to a friend of his, he's a cardinal, and he gets permission to write this book. And the cardinal is like, yeah, yeah, I think this book would be a good thing to have. Well, then he writes it. In the meantime, his friend becomes the actual pope, which is a good thing for Galileo. And Galileo wrote his book on the discourse uh, on the two models of the solar system, basically. And one of the characters who holds the position of the church is a guy by the name of Simplicio, which means simpleton. And basically, he writes it that way, which I, I don't know what he's thinking. Literally, Giordano Bruno had just been burned at the stake. So uh, Galileo knew very well what could happen to him, but he did that anyways. Uh, and eventually, the Pope, who was, like I said, his friend, started listening to his, his people, and, and they told him, you know, he's making a fool of you and all this sort of thing. So they called him up before uh, the, basically, before the court of the uh Catholic Church, and they asked him basically that he had, or they told him basically they have to stop teaching uh, that the earth went around the sun. He supposedly said, yet it moves. Uh, they showed him the instruments that would be used to cut his entrails out of his scrotum. Uh, and of course, they threatened him in other ways. So he certainly did what exactly what they said. Uh, he could not study space anymore. He could not study astronomy. And he couldn't write on astronomy anymore. Uh, he was nearly blind, and he was old, but he got in-house arrest. And again, I think that's because the, the Pope at this time was his friend. So he got in-house arrest for the rest of his life. He spent the rest of his life trying to study motion, and he did so by letting balls roll down inclined planes because he couldn't study free fall vertically because the time clocks weren't that well, right? So he knew that he could relate this to vertical motion by trigonometry. So he just let the balls roll down and he discovered that they fell at a constant acceleration and that all objects fell at the same rate independent of their mass, all sorts of cool stuff. And that was all in an attempt to understand the motion. But in the meantime, he had showed basically that Venus had all of its phases. And in order for Venus, for instance, to have a new phase, uh, Venus would have to be on the other side of the sun over here. So this model does not work at all to uh, have all the phases of the moon on Venus. 
So that was sort of his smoking gun. He also uh, showed that the moon was not a perfect sphere. He could see the craters. He could estimate the height of mountains. Uh, and there was some debate even then as to whether the heavens started inside the orbit of the moon or outside the orbit of the moon. But it was one of those things where when they found something that was inconvenient for it being outside of the moon, they move it inside the moon and, and vice versa. So that one was another one. Uh, Brahe had discovered a, a comet that was changing. So that was another thing that said the heavens were, were definitely changeable. So all that went on. We started to develop a model of the solar system that started to look like this, basically uh, of, of the universe, I should say, that basically looked like this, like a giant grist mill. It was mostly flat, but we knew roughly its length and its length, the largest might be maybe uh, 35 light years across or something like that. And we knew it pretty much in every direction. There was a sort of bulbous part here and a bulbous part here, but that was what many astronomers had uh, figured out. And there was these things called nebulas, which just means a cloud or a, a bit of confusion or something. And all of these things were called nebulas because they didn't look like stars when you look through them, uh, the telescope at them. They looked like fuzzy things, right? Well, it turns out those fuzzy things, the nebulae, N-E-B-U-L-A-E, -E, that's the plural of nebula. Uh, it, it, it could be nebulous, but uh, it's technically supposed to be nebulae. Uh, now, some of them were actually clouds of gas and dust. And those kept the name nebula. They are actually the incubators for stars. They're like mama. Where, where the stars are born. So you'll find sometimes dozens and dozens, sometimes hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars being burned inside these clouds. Others were clusters of stars. Uh, if you can find, for instance, Leo and Gemini in the night sky, right between them is a little shape that looks like this, like a triangle inside of a triangle. And right in between the head of Leo and the uh, upper part of Gemini, there's this constellation that's Cancer. And you'll see a little blurry spot right here in the middle. You can see it with the unaided eye. You look at that with a telescope and you will be amazed at how many stars are in such a small area. And that's what they're seeing. And then other ones turned out to be galaxies, islands of stars. And that was a big deal because all the stars we see, like I told you, was all inside of our galaxy. So it turns out we're inside of a galaxy that has spiral arms like this, okay? And it's about 100,000 light years across. And we're about... 26,000 light years from the center, sort of in the suburbs, if you will. <clears throat> and it takes about 250 million years for us to make one lap. So we're moving at roughly 200 uh, meters per second around this, our solar system is. Now, Around the 1920s, the, the observatory was uh, made in Los Angeles, the same one that you see now, and Hubble was the astronomer there. And he was looking at the Andromeda Nebula, and with this 100-inch or 2.5-meter telescope, he could see that the, the nebula cloud was actually individual stars made in the shape of a flat disk. And he used, this is Hubble, Now he used Henrietta, sorry, I put the R before the N, Henrietta Swan Levitt. Actually, it's about two I's instead of two T's. So Henrietta Swan Levitt had studied these particular type of stars called Cepheid variables. And they're variable stars whose brightness 
as a function of time went like this. And if you knew the time from here to here, you could tell exactly what its luminosity was because you knew what its mass was. So he looked at the Andromeda galaxy and one determined, oh crap, that's not just a cloud, that's an actual another island of stars. And because Henrietta Swan Leavitt had taught him how to uh, gauge a distance based on uh, a Cepheid variable, he was able to figure out that this thing was really, really, really far away like 20 times as far away as he thought our nearest star or farthest stars were. So he knew it had to be a separate island of stars and he saw a bunch of other ones and realized, oh crap, there's a bunch of islands of stars out there. And he discovered furthermore that if he found a galaxy at 100 uh, million light years away, it might be moving at 200 meters per second away from us, but then another one at 200 million light years away would be moving at 400 meters per second. And if it was three times as far away, it'd be moving at 600 meters per second. And it was true if you were looking at those other galaxies from any other galaxy. So every galaxy in space was experiencing the same thing as we were in our galaxy. And the only way you can make any sense of that is not that these things are rushing away from us in, in space, like we got some you know, uh, cosmic COVID or something. No, the only way you can make that up is we're more like galaxies or more like raisins in a raisin bread. And you've taken the raisin bread before you cooked it and you've set it out on the bar letting it uh, rise, letting the yeast do its thing. And the space between the raisins is actually expanding. That was the experimental evidence that pointed us to the Big Bang. Now we had theoretical evidence before that, uh, and it's amazing, but Einstein's general theory of relativity, uh, when properly worked with, unlike Einstein, who when working it out, it was trying to tell him, hey, the universe is expanding, the universe is expanding, but he had no data to suggest that much. So he put in a fudge factor, a cosmological constant to address that. And that stopped everything from moving. Well, a guy by the name of, uh, dang it, Lemaitre, Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian priest. Uh, he worked through Einstein's uh, general relativity and discovered that it was telling him that the universe was expanding. Another guy by the name of Alexander Friedman in Russia, which is a backwaters area at this point in time, they're going through their revolution. He had done the same thing, only we didn't learn about that until sometime later. But this Belgian priest writes to Einstein and Einstein tells him, your math is correct, but your physics is abominable because Einstein believes there's uh, in a standard, uh, a static universe, a universe that looks the exact same now as, as it always has. It's not expanding, it's not contracting, it's not anything. Uh, well, he turned out to be wrong uh, because obviously the data that Hubble brought to him, thanks to the discovery of Henrietta Swan Leavitt, uh, showed us that the universe was in fact expanding. And meanwhile, uh, a guy by the name of uh, George Gamow was working with another guy uh, who was his grad student. I think they were at Union College, the same college that Barbara Streisand went to. And uh, actually, I had the book right here. I was going to pull that up. I can find it, but now I, don't, now I don't see it. Oh, well, I'm trying to remember the guy's name because he just died like in the last 10 years. But this young graduate student, Ralph Alford, that's it. So let me get to the next page so I can write these names down. So we had Georges Friedman, or Georges Lemaitre, Alexander Friedman, I'm probably horribly misspelling their names, uh, both of these guys suggested a Big Bang. Again, the name Big Bang doesn't exist yet but that was given later as a term of derision by one of its uh, uh, adversaries. So they said it came from general relativity. So they predicted it. Then Ralph Alpher, a grad student working under uh, George Gamow, He 
he was sitting to do some calculations. George Gamow was brilliant. Uh, not a theoretical physicist, but a really great idea guy. And he had Ralph Alpher and another guy whose name's escaping me right now. Uh, but anyways, they were both grad students. Ralph Alpher did the, the lion's share of the work. But basically what he did was said, okay, let's assume that the universe was started in a big bang. What can you tell me about it? And Ralph Alpher said, basically using the ideal gas law, uh, believe it or not, uh, he took the fact that we knew how much hydrogen and helium existed. That was the input data. And then he took nuclear physics, what we knew about it. And combine these to say uh, what elements would be produced. We know that basically from the Big Bang, you would get hydrogen, you would get helium. But we also get a little lithium, a little beryllium, and a little bit of boron. Okay, that's basically it. That's all the elements you get from the Big Bang. But he also predicted the existence of a microwave background radiation. and the expansion of the universe. So the expansion of the universe, meaning the universe expanding exactly like uh, later Hubble found. So in other words, he made all these predictions before Hubble had even made uh, that discovery. And it was before the microwave background radiation was measured, but he was also able to predict abundances of elements in nature. All of that was what Ralph Alpher was able to pull out. And he said, look, we should find basically radiation coming from every direction. That's the equivalent of a black body putting out radiation at 2.7 Kelvin. He was like really that that close. It might have been like maybe he said 2.9 and it turned out to be 2.7 or maybe he said 2.5 and it turned out to be 2.7 or something like that. But that's what he predicted uh, for the microwave background radiation uh, and the expansion of the universe. He predicted that everything was a lot closer together in the past and that it should look like this and that and so on and so forth. And George Gamow was quite the joker. He's like me. He's, you know, always making fun or having, you know, making some kind of joke when the joke's there. So he just got an out imagine publishing a paper, a paper with the name Alpha, which sounds like Alpha, and the name Gamow, which sounds like Gamma, which sounds like Gamma, without a beta. So he goes and talks about to a guy by the name of Hans Beth, who was also referred to as Beta because he was sort of like the second best at everything, but he, you know, won Nobel Prize as well and all that good stuff. So he talks him into uh, getting his name on this paper, and Beth's like, oh, I don't really want to do that. I didn't do any work on this. He said, Oh, no, that's a joke. The, the grad students are cool with it. It'll be fine. Well, come to find out, they wrote it, they published it. Nobody read it because everybody thought George Gamma was playing another joke because they saw the names were Alpha, Beta, Gamma. Sadly, Ralph Alford never won a Nobel Prize for that. In the meantime, the people at UC Berkeley, uh, they were trying to build a microwave background or a microwave detector, and they were building this thing about this big, but Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson were working for Bell Labs on the future communication system. They're actually using microwaves. You know, this the predecessor to cell phones basically. And they have these huge microwave antennas and they have one in New Jersey. And they're trying to study how that radiation, you know, behaves within our atmosphere. And they've got this disturbance as a pain. And they, they like, they look for bird droppings. They go climb inside the antenna and scrub it all out really good. Uh, they uh, look for other people leaving their lights on at night. They look for, uh, machines being messed up, uh, replaced components, everything like that. They, they can't find anything. And this constant uh, signal is screwing up everything. And then they read a paper in an astronomy journal 
that these people at UC Berkeley are looking for this radiation. And they're like, crap, we got that. So they send it in. They win the Nobel Prize for discovering something that a grad student uh, uh, predicted. And it was exactly what the grad student predicted. It was exactly the, you know, within a, a few percent error of what the grad student had calculated. And they didn't even know about it. They didn't know about it until after they won the Nobel Prize. So Bob Wilson and Arno, Arno Penzias win the Nobel Prize uh, and share it for the discovery of the microwave background radiation. And that's how we got on this track to where we have a expanding universe uh, that now we even know later is George Smoot, who does appear, by the way, on uh, Big Bang Theory. George Smoot and others uh, basically saw that the expansion is speeding up. Now that was crazy because that implied the existence of dark energy. And we already had a problem with something called dark matter and we still have that problem today. And in fact, we probably know roughly 2% of the universe is the matter that we're used to. So we'd made all this progress. We felt like we were really getting a hands on understanding everything. And then dark matter and dark energy comes along. And it turns out that the matter that we're used to uh, hadronic matter and elementary particle matter and stuff like that, that only makes that up about 2% of the universe. The other 98% is this stuff that we don't know anything about. It's dark energy and dark matter. So that's what this chapter is about, is explaining all that. This dark matter turns out to be a result of when you take and look at, for instance, uh, how fast we orbit around our uh, center of our galaxy, it turns out we're going not the right speed according to Newton's laws of gravity or even Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's as if there's a lot more mass inside of that orbit than we can see. Uh, so they postulated the existence of some dark matter that sort of spherically, symmetrically about the center of our galaxies, and it turns out to be in all galaxies, and that dark matter is, you know, a huge fraction of the, the matter in the universe, and then the dark energy is the energy that's causing not only the galaxies to move away from each other as if they had momentum from the uh, growth of space after the Big Bang, but as if something's actually speeding it up. So that's where we got the dark matter. Now, it turns out, as you would have it, that uh, the Big Bang uh, isn't necessarily believed by everyone, but it's essentially maybe a 98, 99% deal with scientists, uh, physicists, cosmologists, astrophysicists, uh, all those people are probably 99.9% certain of it. We've got a ton of data. We, we keep getting data that, that uh, uh, proves it more right, if you will, and we and never find anything contradicting it. The last thing we found that looked like what contradicted it was a star that was uh, older than the universe, but the error bars on that was way too big to really say it was actually older than the universe. But by our stellar models, it seemed it could be. Uh, so that, that's part of the problem. But it turns out if you make a plot of uh, the distance away, uh, from the galaxies, you'll see that basically making that plot of distance versus distance away from us, they all converge back about 13 billion years ago. And that's what Hubble's law gives us. Hubble's law tells us that the universe uh, is expanding in such a way that, like I said, if you double the distance away from this galaxy to some other galaxy, uh, let's say that first one's 100 megaparsecs. If you look at another galaxy that's instead 200 megaparsecs away, that galaxy will be moving away from us twice as fast as the first one. And if another one's 400 megaparsecs away, it'll be moving away four times as fast as the 100 megaparsec one and twice as fast as the 200 megaparsec one. And the only way you can make sense of that, like I said, is the space itself is expanding. It's in a whole different version of the Doppler effect. It's a whole different version of everything. And what's commonly thought, and this is what I want to root out of your brain. I'm going to go in there with a pickaxe and pull all this crap out. Uh, commonly, people think that the space, emptiness, was all, that, all there was. And that into that space, 
exploded matter and that that made the universe but that doesn't work because that's not the definition of the universe and that's not what the data says the definition of the universe is all the matter and energy and dark matter and dark energy and the space itself that is the universe and that was what was created in the big bang if it doesn't hurt your head to think about it, you're probably not thinking about it deeply enough. And we don't think the universe is expanding necessarily into some bigger thing. The universe is all there is and it's expanding. Now, if it was that other thing, you could go and sort of trace the velocity back of all the different galaxies and all of them would converge on one point in space. And that one point would be considered the center of the universe. And that's not what that's not what the Big Bang shows at all. And that's not what the data shows at all. In fact, it's more like if you were to take a balloon and blow it up maybe about this big. And then you put a galaxy uh, along lines about one centimeter apart, you put in a galaxy and then go one centimeter below it and put galaxies about one centimeter apart and then one centimeter above that and do the same thing and then keep doing it till the whole thing's covered. Uh, and then you blow that balloon up that would actually give you exactly the results that Hubble got. You would see the nearest galaxy, if you blew it up from where the, the nearest two were instead of one centimeter apart, they're now two centimeters apart. Well, then the next one, which was two centimeters apart, will now be four centimeters apart. And if you assume that happened in a certain amount of time, you can divide that distance that it traveled divided by time, and you see that second dot would be going twice as fast as that first dot. And the third dot would be going three times as fast as that first dot. And the fourth dot would be four times as fast. That's what it's like. So it's like being on the surface of a balloon. And the big question is, are we the only universe? And the only reason why we postulate that really is because quantum mechanics comes in and gives us all this probability and uncertainty. And people just do not like that. And I don't either. I hate it. Uh, Newton hated it. Uh, Wood hated it. Einstein definitely hated it. But uh, it might just be something where we have to deal with. But one of the ideas of explaining that is that in some sense, every time something occurs or a decision is made, a new universe is created. Or another way of saying it is there's an infinity of universes and every possibility can happen in one of those universes. And the possibility that you got happened to be what happened just in your galaxy or your universe, I should say, not your galaxy. Uh, so that's another explanation. So now I've given you sort of the fundamental idea of the Big Bang. It turns out that after the Big Bang, uh, that leaves some problems like uh, the universe at this end and this end, which isn't really an end, but that are really, really far apart, are too close to the same temperature. There's this picture uh, called, the, called the cosmic microwave background uh, image, and it looks like a speckled bird's egg or something like that. Uh, if you look at it, that is the reddest of the red to the bluest of the blue is the extreme differences in temperature. And that difference is only like 10 to the negative ninth Kelvin. So it's a really small difference in temperature. And we can't really make sense of that uh, temperature equilibrating so easily across such vast distances. So a guy by the name of Alan Guth at MIT uh, suggested the idea of inflation. So he imagined that, you know, somewhere around the 10, 10 to the negative 20 some second, uh, the universe went from this big, maybe the size of uh, half the size of the nucleus of an atom to maybe the size of 10 atoms all at once. And it happened so quick that that allowed all the equilibration of the temperature. So we've got that we've got going on. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, part of cosmology today. We have to figure out is that inflationary model uh, happening or not. And it makes very, uh, it doesn't make very easy predictions that we can uh, easily disqualify or easily show to be false. Uh, and my understanding of it's pretty weak. So I, I can't tell you exactly why, but I've been advised that that's the case. Someone said it's like nailing jelly to a jello to a wall. So I guess you can get that. But that's basically uh, what cosmology is about. We'll be using, I'll be teaching you how to do light years and light minutes and light seconds and uh, calculate the uh, mass of our galaxy. Uh, tell you that it turns out our galaxy has about 100 billion stars in it. And the mass of our galaxy is about two times 10 to the, in fact, about three times 10 to the 15th, I think, uh, kilograms. 
Uh, there turns out to be about 100,000 galaxies in the observable universe, like one for every star in our galaxy. Uh, some really crazy stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna finish with that and uh, solve some problems uh, next time, and we'll be done. But you can you can definitely start on chapters 43 and 44 now. Uh, I think I've given you enough details. All you have to do is do a quick skimming of the reading, uh, or even just reading the examples might be helpful. But I, I would definitely recommend you read the text. Everybody's free to go. If you have any questions, feel free to stick around. And remember, our labs are optional this week. Thank you, Jared. Anyone have any questions? Yes, uh, Professor Younger, um, the chapter eight, I spoke to you last uh, week about the chapter eight and nine test. Did you okay, make that chapter available? eight and nine test. Hey, yep, I got it right here. It's four, eight, and nine, dang it. I have, that has not been marked off. Let me do that right now. You need it opened, right? Yes, sir. Okay, I will do that right now. Uh, I've got that and I got a test to fix. I, I've sent out all those practice tests today. There's a practice test that was misbehaving. I've done one of them. Now I got to do another. So I'll do that right now, Mario. Sorry about that. Okay, it's all right. All right, thank you. Have a good night. You too, bud. Nate, Bye. did you have a question, sir? All right, well, I'll call it a day. Everybody have a good night.